I, I want to start off last week because, as you guys know, this is part two of last week, and I just, again, I want to say thank you because you guys have shown me such love and support over the last few weeks. If you don't know, my mom passed away on the second, and you guys have been bombarding me with cards and uh, text messages, phone calls, hugs, love, and so I'm, I'm very grateful. It, it has been much appreciated. Um, and we are having her service uh, right here on August 10th at 11 a.m. If, if you knew my mom or you would just like to join, uh, Pastor Tony is going to do uh, that service. So, but I was reflecting um, the last couple of weeks, and I was just kind of thinking, what did my mom teach me? Like, like and it, my, we were, my mom was a single mom for a while, and so it was just the two of us. She was like my best friend, and... I was thinking about it, just reflecting back about her, saying, what lesson can I say that I came out of my adolescence with that she taught me? And, and as I just thought about it and thought about it, I couldn't really put my finger on one specific thing necessarily or one verse that was like this. She always ingrained this verse into my mind, although she was a, a firm believer, and she, she had ingrained many verses into my mind. And so... Like, I was just, okay, what, what I, would, I would like to think I was a good kid, you know, maybe, maybe some people disagree with that, but like, how did I get there? Like, how, how did I come away with some of the, the lessons that I did? And it kind of dawned on me one, one night, and I was, I was thinking about it, that she taught me resolve. And that's our title again for today, it's Resolve Part 2. Um, and, and resolve just simply means to decide firmly on a course of action. That's what resolve is, to, to decide firmly on a course of action. Like, like, I am going to move in a very specific direction, and I will not be swayed from that. And, and I think that's, although my mom, I don't know that my mom ever said the word resolve to me, um, or this, the verse that I kind of found that goes with this. I don't know that she ever specifically in this context quoted this verse to me or taught me this verse, but as I was thinking about it, I was like, that's it. And I was searching, okay, what's, what's a verse that would go with this? So I came up with 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight, And it says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And, and I have to tell this story again because it was just that crazy. I told it last week, but I was sitting in bed one night and it was, it was late and I was on my phone. I was thinking about this concept of resolve and my mom and looking for a verse and I came across 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. And I read it, and as, I mean, I was in the middle of reading it, and I, I knew, I was like, this is the verse. This is it. If I had to summarize in one verse what I learned from my mom, it would be this verse. And I, I, I no more than get to the very last word of the verse. And I mean, this was, the, the, you know, if you need proof that there's a God, there's a lot of things, here's one of them to me, that I finished reading this verse and out of nowhere, we weren't, talking, we weren't talking about the Bible. I don't even know that she knows what I was looking at. She said, hey, if there was one verse that you had for ICC, for the congregation, for the people of ICC, if you could summarize your entire ministry or your preaching or just one thing to charge them with, what would it be? As I was finishing reading this verse, and I knew immediately in that moment, it's this verse. It is that we stand firm, that, that no matter what happens in this life, that we are immovable, unshakable, as some translations say. Just nothing can move us, and we're always giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, doing what he has called us to do. And I'm like, that's it. That's my verse for ICC. So then, of course, my wheels are cranking like, okay, can I preach this? You know, how, how would this go? And here we are, we're two weeks into uh, just one verse. So we looked last week. I want to do a really quick review because this second part isn't going to make a whole lot of sense if I don't really break down this verse. So real quickly, uh, there's four big phrases 
in this verse that we need to cover and kind of dig into a little bit to see. Because, hey, if you look at this verse, like, um, that's a tall order, isn't it? Like, that's not easy to do. So Paul is speaking to the Corinthians and speaking to us, saying, hey, stand firm. D- don't let anything move you. Give everything that you have to God. We're like, okay, that sounds great on paper, but I don't know if I can do that. So kind of last week is the what we're supposed to do, and this week, I promised you, is the why, and hopefully I can make a good case for that. So here's our four uh, key phrases. Therefore, my br- dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. And we said that 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 word, the original word stand firm, means to uh, be steadfast as you would see it in the New King James Version, or it's not given to fluctuation or moving off course. So we're staying on course. And and, and we wrote down, don't let culture, convenience, or concerns sway you away from Christ. Don't let anything, any external, uh, anything that, that can come your way, don't let that turn you away from what you are called to do in Christ. So that's stand firm. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Okay, so it sounds a lot like stand firm, doesn't it? It's, it sounds almost like the same thing, and it's very, very close, but what Paul is doing is he's backing up and he's saying what he just said again because that makes it really important, but he's saying it just a little different way. And that word means without movement or change of status. So it's another way to say to stay on the course, and in this case, to stay on the course of truth. So, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Our next phrase is, Always give yourselves fully. Now, fully, that's asking a lot, isn't it? And, and that original word in the Greek means to exceed the ordinary or necessary. And, and I, thought, I thought this was really key because, see, we oftentimes want to just do what's necessary. How do we call that? We call it the bare minimum. That's often how we try to get away with our faith. We want to do the bare minimum because, you know, we want to have our lives too. And when Paul is saying, always give yourselves fully, he's saying, listen, don't just do what's ordinary or don't do what's just necessary. We've got to do more than what is just just expected of us. It's a tall order. And then our last, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, always gives yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Now, this one is probably the most complicated, so we had to dig into some different scriptures. If we look in John chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, I'll just put it on the screen here real fast, but in John 6 is the feeding of the 5,000, it's the work of the Lord, and it says, then they asked him... What must me do to do the works God requires? Verse 29, Jesus answered, the work of God or the work of the Lord, here we go, he's going to reveal it is, is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Now, sounds pretty simple, right? Oh, okay, the work of the Lord is we just believe? It's no big deal, I can do that, right? Because believing is just believing. Believing is just head knowledge, and we can say that we do that. And as I was reading this and digging in, I was like, I think there's a little bit more than when it says to do the work of the Lord. I think there's a little bit more than just believing. That's a great start. Obviously, we are commanded and charged to believe in Christ, But could there be more to this? Well, the answer to that question is yes. We looked in John chapter 3. This is, of course, the John 3, 16 passage, Nicodemus. Jesus says, whoever believes, there's our key word, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. So it's okay, great. So we got it. We've got to believe. Now, what Jesus does is he flips this upside down, kind of gives us the opposite or the antagonist of what believing is. And he says, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So we went from believing to rejecting. 
It's kind of a, a big jump there, isn't it? And if you look at that original word that's reject, it means to disobey, rebel, to be disloyal, or to refuse conformity. So if the opposite of believing is rejecting God, disobeying, not, not conforming to what God has called us to do, then I think we would say believing is obeying God, conforming to what he wants us to do, following his commands, not rebelling against him. So the works of the Lord are obeying his commands, and, and I think here's kind of a, a modern, easy way to understand it. It's making Jesus the center of your life 24-7, 365. That's how we set it. It's, it's making Jesus the absolute most important thing in your life. That is the works of the Lord and everything that goes with it, following what he has in his word, obeying him, loving people like he loved us, that's the works of the Lord. So here's our verse, the whole thing through, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And that, just, that last part just means, listen, you know it will return a product. It will not be useless. There will be something that you will get if you do this. Here's how I kind of rewrote this verse. Kind of, for me, I'm not rewriting scripture, please understand. But it's like for me to really grasp this. It's be steadfast about staying on the course of God's truth while always going above and beyond loving, obeying, and serving God. Simple, right? Everybody like, yeah, I got that down. We can just go to lunch now because I'm, I'm doing that 100%. Anybody want to? Don't raise your hand right now. It'd be really bad. Okay, if you weren't paying attention, you're like, oh, are we supposed to raise our hand? Don't do that, okay? All right. But I don't want you to be fooled into thinking this is too hard or it's not worth it. Please don't think that way. See, we often, we often just try to sprinkle some Jesus into our lives or we often just let him into specific days or specific time periods like Jesus you have got my Sunday mornings unless the weather's really nice and the boat is looking really good or you know what it, you fill in you know golf or whatever your thing is okay all right but Jesus for, for the most part you've got my Sunday mornings okay and then hopefully there's like a day in the week that you wake up a little bit early you got an extra three and a half minutes so you pray and read your Bible and that's your Jesus time. And then the rest of the week is a lot more about you than it is about Jesus. And see, that's not how God has called us to act. And I'm really grateful that God didn't just and continues to not just give us, oh, an hour and a half on Sunday morning and three and a half minutes during the week, right? Does God give us everything, every moment, 24-7, 365? He is our Savior? Uh-huh. And that's what he's calling for us. But don't think it's too hard or it's not worth it. That's very, very, very dangerous thinking to think that it's okay to sprinkle some Jesus into different areas or different aspects of our lives. So last week, I, I left you on this cliffhanger. I, I made a, a humongous promise that I was going to prove to you that it is worth living like this. And then I left last week and I went, what on earth did I just do, right? Like, oh my, I've got my work cut out for me. So last week was the what we should do. We should live like 1 Corinthians 15, 58. This week is the why. I, I, hopefully today I can prove to you that it's worth it and why we should want to live that way. So I want to give you the best motivation of all. So I want to read our verse but I want you to look at it, okay? Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord 
is not in vain. Now, last week, purposely, we skipped one big word in this verse. And this word is a major indicator that there's an expectation to live this way. What's that word? It's, it's one of my favorite words when I'm, when I'm reading. What is it? Therefore. And whenever we see the word therefore, we ask ourselves a question that is, thank you, Gene, and a few other people. What's the therefore, therefore? When you see this in Scripture, it means, I just said a whole bunch of really big, complicated, you're probably not going to get it maybe the first time that you read it through, so you got to dig in a little bit. I said all of this, and here's the summary. Here's why. Here's, here's the big deal about this, and that's exactly what Paul does in this. I'm totally, if you can't tell, I'm totally geeked out about this stuff today, okay? Just bear with me, all right? So he says, therefore, we need to live like this. Now, how is it that Paul can put such a tall order on the Corinthians and us? So he's, he's writing to these believers in Corinth. By the way, Corinth uh, at that time was not exactly a God-fearing place, okay, as basically was most every place around there. Like, there was a lot going on, and, and uh, sinfully, I'll just leave it right there, but, but they had just as much and probably way, way more to deal with in that realm than we do. So Paul is calling them to live this way, and he's also calling us to live this way. So how can he do that? How in the world can Paul make such a tall order for that? Well, in, in the verses right before 58, Paul is talking about resurrection, Okay, not just resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection of us. And a little bit of background, the Greeks and the Corinthians, they had a real problem with resurrection. Like, like they just didn't get it, they didn't believe in it, and they were kind of rejecting it. So what Paul is doing is he's trying to kind of explain, hey, there will be a resurrection. And we know Jesus said this too, right? Remember Jesus when, when he healed Lazarus and, and he was talking to one of Lazarus's sisters and what did, what did Jesus say? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And so this concept of resurrection, they had a problem with. So in verse 50, so if you're in 1 Corinthians 15, just look back at verse 50 and we're gonna make our way all the way to 58. So in these next eight verses, Paul is really going to break down this whole concept of resurrection and prove to us that we should live this way. Verse 50, he says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So what he is saying here, uh, now, this is some very, very deep theological stuff that I would do a terrible disservice to you if I tried to fully theologically explain it to you, okay? We're going to scratch the surface of what this means today, okay? What he is saying, though, is he's saying our bodies in this present state are not suited for heaven, okay? That's, that's, that's what he's saying here. Again, he's saying a lot more than that, but for the future kingdom, okay, heaven, God's kingdom, these bodies aren't going to do it. Like, like, can you imagine trying to make this body work for eternity? How do you think that would work out? Like, I would suggest maybe you should eat way more veggies and wear way more sunscreen, right? If you think this body is going to last for eternity, you got another thing coming. So here we have a problem, don't we? We have a major problem. If we are going to spend eternity with Christ... This body isn't going to do it. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying one day we are going to be physically resurrected from the grave to heaven. Now, again, it's going to get a little deep here, okay? And it's a really good thing this body doesn't go there. We're moving, okay? That's good news, okay? By the way, if you didn't figure that out, we're moving to spend our eternity with Jesus, and we need new equipment. Think about it. If you're going to go 
I won't say the word. We're going to go underwater like 100 feet, 120 feet, and we're going to go like explore wrecks. And we're gonna, what do we call that? Scuba diving, right? When you go scuba diving, do you need special equipment? What do you need? Scuba gear. I know. This is this cookies bottom shelf stuff here, guys, okay? All right. If you're going to go snow skiing, do you just walk out just like this or shorts and a t-shirt onto the top of a mountain and say, okay, I'm skiing. What do you need? Well, you need skis. You probably need some warmer clothes, okay? All right. But you need skis or you need a, a snowboard or you need, you know, more stuff. If you're going to go into space, do you need anything special to go into space? You need a space suit. I don't know what that's called. That's just a space suit, I guess, okay? Right? If you're going to heaven, which I pray that you are, you need some special equipment. And Paul is saying, this body's not going to do. You need a new body. You need something else. What's that solution? It's resurrection. Or a Bible sometimes calls it glorification, right? So back to verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood, dead when we're, when we're dead, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And then he says this, listen. I tell you a mystery. Now, what he's saying there with this mystery doesn't mean I'm going to tell you something that can't be understood or, or it's kind of, ooh, spooky, it's weird, you're not going to get it. What he's saying is I'm going to reveal to you new information. Here's something that I haven't taught before. That's what he's saying here, okay? He says, we will not all sleep but we will all be changed. Now, pause just for a second. This is the perfect verse to put up in the nursery of a church, okay? We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Okay, little church humor there. <clears throat> we will not all sleep, that means to die, but we will all, if you are a believer, you will be changed into something else. Verse 52, in a flash... And the original word for flash, it's, it's where we get our word atom. It means the smallest uh, measurement of time that, that you, you can't get any smaller than this measurement of time. So it says, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, and what they think that that means is the time that it takes for light to pass, I think it's from your iris to your retina, or, or reverse that, I don't know. It's like a sixth of a nanosecond. So basically, Paul is saying immediately. This is just, just not drug out process immediately in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. <clears throat> For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Now, Again, I'm going to barely scratch the surface of what this means. <clears throat> what Paul is saying in here is not all believers will die. There will be a second coming of Christ. We call it the rapture. He will come and catch away all of his believers. <clears throat> At that time, there will be people still alive. <clears throat> you better now? I'm good now. Are you good now? I'm good. Okay. Okay. All right, so when, when Christ comes again, he is going to catch up all of the believers. Some will be dead, some will still be alive. That's, the, the, again, scratching the surface of what Paul is saying here. Now, who, what, when, where, why, and how, I don't know, and we're not going to talk about it today, okay? Because I know a lot of you guys are like, oh, dude, we're going to dig into this. No, we're not. Not today. I interesting stuff, different, different story, different day. The important part is, we get new bodies. That's, that's super, super good news. Now, if you want to take this further, there's a parallel passage. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, right in there. That's the really, really famous rapture passage. You can go do your own research there. But it says very, very, very similar thing. Okay. Now, here's where it gets cool or it gets interesting or really where the motivation uh, comes in. This is how we can understand, like, Paul is like, here's how I want you to act, but, but here's the reason why you can act like that. Verse 54, 
When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, that, that's those who are already dead, and the mortal with immortality, that's those who are still alive. We were, remember, we're talking about when Christ returns to come and get us. It's going to be a good day. All right. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Now, before I continue, I want to read you something. Okay, it's, it's not really a poem, but it's, it's just kind of a writing, and I'm not going to put it on the screen until we're done reading it, because I don't want to give it away, but you might want to take a picture of it when we're done, so you can read it afterwards, okay? So, listen to this. There is a preacher of the old school, but he speaks as boldly as ever. He is not popular... Though the world is his parish, and he travels every part of the globe and speaks in every language, he visits the poor, calls upon the rich, preaches to people of every religion and no religion, and the subject of his sermon is always the same. He is an eloquent preacher, often stirring feelings which no other preacher could and bringing tears to eyes that never weep. His arguments none are able to refute, nor is there any heart that has remained unmoved by the force of his appeals. He shatters life with his message. Most people hate him. Everyone fears him. His name? Death. Death. Every tombstone is his pulpit, every newspaper prints his text, and someday every one of you will be his sermon. That's big, isn't it? That's heavy. What Paul is about to do here, I I wanted to paint this picture. You can go ahead and put that up there, so if you want to take a picture of it. I wanted to paint the seriousness of this moment, that there are a lot of bad things that happen on this earth, sickness, disease, sadness, loss of loved ones, I mean, I mean just all of those things, and those are horrible, horrible things, and thankfully, because of God, because of the comfort that he gives us, because of the healing, however he chooses to, we can recuperate from those things. We can heal from those things. But death is the most serious thing we can't come back from. That is the biggest negative, I guess if you can say, in our lives that we deal with. It is a very, very serious issue. And unless Jesus comes back in our lifetime, which, you know, you're probably like, yes, he's coming back in our lifetime. I just want to remind you that the disciples thought that too, and every generation since has thought that. So don't, I mean, yeah, pray Jesus comes back, that's great, but live like you are just going to push through, okay? But unfortunately... Unless Jesus comes back, no one gets to avoid that preacher. We all have to deal with that. And and it's the biggest fear in life, other than they say, people say that public speaking is the biggest fear in life, which is, you know, they would rather die than speak publicly, which is kind of odd that this is the profession that I chose. Um, But no one gets a pass. No one gets a pass on this. So... I wrote this down. Death is the worst possible thing that can happen to us in this life, this life. And eternal death, which is separation from Jesus in an eternal torment and misery, eternal death is the worst possible thing that can happen in the next life. All right. Am I clear on this? Okay. So now Paul is about to tell us one day, Here's here's where this passage just gets really, really cool. 
Paul is about to tell us one day that preacher of death will be retired, that there will be no more work for that preacher, that that, that we don't need you anymore, death. You've got no place here anymore, is what Paul is about to say. He's going to tell us, actually, that death itself is going to die. And that's a pretty cool concept. So then Paul goes on. He he quotes or references Isaiah 25, 8 and Hosea 13, 14. So Isaiah 25, 8 says this. He's, He's prophesying. He's speaking on behalf of God. He will swallow up death forever. I love that. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. Here it is hundreds of years before even Christ, and, and, and Isaiah is prophesying, God one day is going to come and he's just going to swallow up death himself. No more death. Now, Hosea 13, 14, even cooler. I I, I put this in the New King James Version. I like how it says it. He says, again, Hosea, speaking on behalf of God, he says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Okay, now, that's a big deal. Like, redeem means to buy back, to get back. He's like, like, I I will rescue them. I I will get them back from death. They may have died on this earth, but I'm going to get them back, and they're going to live eternally with me. Now, God says this, O oh, death, I will be your plagues. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction. How cool is that? God is taunting death and saying, no, 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 no. Everyone fears you. I don't. You will bow and I will take you out. And then I love how he ends it. Pity is hidden from my eyes. When I do this death, when I take you out, I will have no pity. And that's what Paul is referencing. That's how Paul can call us to live in such a a, a very, very challenging but possible way. So back to verse 54, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Paul is taunting death. Now, (laughs) If anyone is accustomed to death, it would be Paul. Because you can look through Scripture and see, uh, what was he shipwrecked? Two, three times? How many times was Paul beaten within an inch of his life? Whipped over and over and over? Left for dead. They, They actually stoned him and beat him so badly that they thought he was dead, and this dude just would not die. So if anyone was accustomed to death and knowing what it is to literally be within an inch of death, it would be Paul. And how in the world would Paul be able to taunt death like this? Where is your victory, death? Where's your sting? You've got nothing on me. Before I go on, I want to read you another story. This, this is a story of resolve. This is a story of people who just have decided, my life is with Christ, and, and, and that's it. Like, I, I will not turn. This is called the 40 Martyrs of Sebasti. And after 316 A.D., the emperor Licinius decreed a persecution of Christians in the East. He threatened death if they failed to renounce their faith. In 320 AD, 40 young Christian Roman soldiers refused to sacrifice to idols and were tried before the tribunal at Sebasti Cappadocia. The governor tried threats, <clears throat> threats, bribery, and torture to persuade the young men, but they stood firm. He put 40 in prison where it is said that Christ appeared and encouraged them to persevere. Incensed by the soldiers' obstinacy, 
the governor ordered that they be stripped and left to die on a frozen lake. Listen to this. He arranged a fire and a warm bath on the shore to tempt them to apostatize or to just give up their faith. All 40 signed a will drafted by St. Melidius that expressed their faith, unity, and courage. The young men, here's the resolve, did not wait to be stripped, but removed their clothes themselves. And together they prayed, Lord, we are 40 engaged in this contest. Grant that 40 may receive crowns and that we may not fall short of that sacred number. After one night's ordeal, however, one soldier caved, but died of extreme heat in the bath, losing his martyr's crown. He gave up, renounced his faith, went to shore, hopped in the jacuzzi. It was too hot. He died, lost his martyr's crown. But an off-duty guard, prompted by the martyr's courage and a dream, professed himself a Christian And took his place, thus preserving their number. There was no sting of death. They didn't have to worry about that because the victory of life, and that's eternal life through Christ, was so much greater. And they had that in their focus. That's what they had resolved to stand firm no matter what. That's resolve. So back to 55, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Now, again, another one of those verses that is super, super big theologically. It just means because of sin and the law, we know death is a problem without Jesus, okay? That's what that means. I don't want to focus on that too much. Now, verse 57, here's the culmination of all of that scary stuff about death. All of that haunting, all of that talk about being raised and resurrection and all that. Here's the culmination. But, such an important word, but thanks be to God, exclamation point. Like, like, like he's almost shouting. He is, he is so excited about this. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, death, you're no longer scary. The most scary thing that humanly we could experience on this earth, you are no longer scary to me because I know that I have victory in Christ. That even if you take my life on this earth, I know what this next life is going to look like. I know what my eternity is going to be and it is going to be with my creator and I can't wait for that. That's how Paul can live with resolve. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's our next verse. Therefore, therefore, because of all of that in those eight verses, uh, yep, we taunted death, we talked about how scary it is, how it can take you out, and all of that, but because we have victory, therefore, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So I can say my mom indirectly taught me resolve. Now, do I get that right every time? No. At least I could say she taught me the concept of it. And it has helped me throughout my life, although I've made some horrible decisions. But I know that God is calling me. But more importantly than what my mom taught me, God is calling me to stand firm. To decide ahead of time, God, I'm going to follow you no matter what. I, I, I will not let sickness or disease or death or, or anything that, that this world has to offer, I will not allow those things to get in the way of you. 
I will choose to follow you with everything that I have. Again, do I do that right all the time? No, not even close. But that's the goal. That's what Paul is calling us to do, and that's obviously what Christ is calling us to do. So I want to finish with this. The Christian life, now pause just for a second. When I say the Christian life, I mean this is a blanket statement. You call yourself a Christian. You say you are saved. You say you are going to heaven. Jesus is your Savior. However you want to say that, this means you, okay? This means the Christian life, however you want to call it, commences, begins. This is how it ought to begin. This is how it has to begin and continues with the resolve to fully give our lives to Christ because he gives us victory from death. Through Jesus Christ. We have to begin and continue with this notion that, God, you're going to have my everything. Because, again, you can't give yourself partially to Jesus and have Jesus partially be your Savior. This is an all-or-nothing faith. Again, are you going to get everything right and you're going to be super Christian the moment you get saved? No. That's why we have sanctification, that process of becoming more and more like Jesus. But we have to resolve to say, God, you have everything. I'm going to mess up. I'm sorry. I'm going to work at living more and more and more like your son, Jesus. That's the resolve that we are called to have as followers of Jesus. I'll read it one more time. The Christian life commences and continues with the resolve to fully give our lives to Christ because... Why? Why can we live like that? Why can we live like 1 Corinthians 15, 58? Because he gives us victory from death. We no longer have to be afraid of what's ahead of us, inevitably. He gives us victory from death through what? Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Not your good works, not your grandmama's faith, not your church attendance, none of that. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, not a truth, and not a life. No, the way, the truth, and the life. Only through Jesus. Let's pray. God, I thank you that your word is so clear. And God, I know this is a tall order for me to stand here in front of these people and say, you need to, you must stand firm. You must let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Always making Jesus the center of your life 24-7, 365. That is a tall order. But it's possible. And God, I'm so glad that you have called us not just to live like this, but that you have given us a reason to live like this. Because like Jesus did, like Paul did, we can laugh in the face of death. We can say, you know what? I know where my eternity is. My eternity is with a heavenly father who loves me so much, loves me enough to send his son to die for me. That's where I want my eternity. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I know that there are probably some here this morning who Or maybe not sure now. Maybe you were counting on something else for your faith. Maybe you were counting on good works. Maybe that's what you've been taught your entire life. I assure you the Bible does not say that. The Bible does say believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And we know that believing means following after him. So if you're here this morning 
and you want to know that you know that you know for sure that eternity in heaven with a perfect, amazing, loving, heavenly Father is, is your destiny, I want to give you an opportunity this morning. Right here, right now in this moment, if that's you, you say, I, 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 I want this relationship with Jesus. I want what you're talking about. Right here in this moment, would you just say, God, I need you. God, I trust you. God, I put my full faith in you. God, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness, all that junk in my life. I accept Jesus as my Savior and nothing else. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you said that this morning for the very first time or today is the day that you know, I would love to be able to pray for you. I'm not gonna call you out or, or, or make any deal of it, but would you just slip your hand up and say, today is the day I got it right. Today is the day I decided to give my life to Jesus. I decided to establish a real relationship with Jesus. Thank you. God, I'm so grateful that you have made a way that you didn't just leave us here to figure it out on all our, all our own, but God, that you have made a way for us to laugh in the face of death and to spend eternity with you. Thank you, God, that you are good. Thank you that you are a savior. That is who you are. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, be honored and blessed by it. God, help us to be a generous church and do amazing things in this community and in this world for your kingdom. We love you, Jesus. And it is in the most amazing, powerful name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen.